All right, so let's start. It's May 1st, 2012, and I'm here with Mike Markla, and we're going to do his oral history for the archives of the Computer History Museum. Mike, welcome. Thank you. So let's talk about your upbringing, your, your birth, your education, your parents, a little well, bit about that. I'm a fourth generation Californian. I was born right in the middle of Los Angeles uh, at St. Vincent's Hospital. Uh, 1942. Um, went to John Burroughs High School in Burbank. Basically grew up in, mostly in Burbank. And uh, wanted to go to college right out of high school, but I couldn't afford it. So I went to Glendale Junior College for two years, and then I transferred to USC, where I got a master's degree in EE uh, in 1966. So I have a BS and an MS, a double E. Um, when you think back to your high school days, was uh, can you think of a teacher or anyone who was particularly influential in helping you think about engineering or math? Well, I had a I had a physics teacher in high school that really got me going on on electronics and physics and all that stuff. And uh, I can't even rem remember his name, but he was really good. <laughs> and. Uh, that was stuff that I enjoyed doing, and the more I did it, the better I liked it. So uh, he he probably encouraged me uh, to be a Tommy Techie uh, at that point, uh, enough to cause me to start off in that direction. So when I went to uh, uh, Glendale, I took uh, analytic geometry and calculus and chemistry and all the stuff to uh, to go down that path. And why did you pick USC? Uh, gosh, I was accepted at, at uh, Harvey Mudd. I was accepted at Caltech and USC. And uh, I just went and visited each of those. And uh, I did not like the ambiance at Caltech at all. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I was more serious than most of the students at that point, but uh, it, it, it just didn't click with me. Was it? Did it strike you as just not students weren't working that hard? Was that it? Well, no, they uh, they were just not applying themselves. They weren't serious about learning and and the immature. I would I would say is the best word. And uh, heck, I had to work and support myself, you know, to be, even be able to go to to college. So. I just I just didn't sit well with me. Did you work your way through junior college and college? Yeah, yeah. What sorts of things did you do? Oh, gee, uh, everything from sticking records in into the sleeves to uh, um, technician to um, I used to build stereos for people because they knew I knew what I was doing so that I don't know how much it would cost and I'd go buy the equipment, stick it all together. And, uh, I worked in a gas station. I worked uh, in a uh, auto body shop. I'm a pretty good painter. I painted a couple of cars of my own. <laughs> uh, so I just, whatever I could do, uh, I worked for a catering company that uh, catered to uh, movie locations, and that was interesting, but boy, was it hard work. That's a classic L.A. Yeah. kind of job, it seems Yeah, right, like. right. Well, living in Burbank, you know, you have all those studios around there. So uh, there was that infrastructure available, and then you took whatever job you could get. Um, I worked at Safeway, started out as a uh, box boy and ended up uh, assistant manager in the produce department. You do what you, what you can do. <laughs> was that influential? Do you think that uh, looking back on it, that sort of just always having to work and sort of bootstrap your way up uh, have an influence on you? Uh, yes and no. Um, some of those jobs I really enjoyed. Uh, the t one of the technician jobs that I had was uh, at a company called Research Craft, owned by a, a gentleman by the name of Al Ellsworth. And Al um, took a liking to me, I guess. F he found out I was taking engineering and going to USC, and 
So he took me out of the stuff and the records in the sleeves and gave me a job as a technician and gave me some challenging uh, uh, projects to work on. And uh, he'd, left, he'd leave me alone. He, he had a beautiful library of, uh, of uh, technical books. He'd say, there's the books. Here's the job I want you to do. And uh, go do it. And if you really, really need help, come and ask me. <laughs> he was great. So uh, and we, every Saturday, we would go down to the war surplus stores in LA. And he'd say, tell me when I get to $100. And he would buy circuit boards and relays and meters and uh, you name it. And he had a room bigger than this room, stacked floor to ceiling with different kinds of components. Tubes, anything you might want, resistors, capacitors. <laughs> Was this for no particular purpose? Uh, no particular pur purpose. He knew he would build something out of some of it. <laughs> So he would give me these jobs, go mechanize all the record presses, make them automatic so one guy can run two presses instead of two guys running two presses. And I did it. Took me all summer, but I did it. And how did you go about that? I, uh, first I had to figure out what the presses did, and they're not very complicated. You know, they have uh, different cycles, and you would put the, the vinyl in the, in the top, and it would and you had to have the, the two halves of the record uh, that it was going to press. Uh, and so it would fill that cavity up, and then a certain amount of time at a certain temperature, the vinyl would fill in the, the grooves of the record. And the biggest problem they had was what they called non-fill, where there would be little bubbles or something, and, and, the, and the, the record groove would be imperfect because of little non-filled areas. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so once I figured out how that really worked and what made it go, I just built a box of relays with timers and uh, made that do what the guy running the press was doing. Mm -hmm. So you just load one, start it, turn around, load another one, start it, I'm back to the first one, take the record out, <laughs> load it. <laughs> so it worked? Yeah, it worked great. And then uh, it uh, cut that cost, that part of the labor down by a factor two. Did your parents have any strong feelings about your being an engineer or doing something else as a career? I don't think so. Um, my dad was a very inventive guy. He was always inventing something. Right. And uh, my grandfather had five patents. Uh, so I guess that, that tinkering uh, mentality runs in the family. Right. Uh, what were the patents then? My grandfather's yes. patents? Oh, gee. Um, the most important one was a uh, mechanism for uh, attaching the chains that go around a uh, uh, railroad car with logs on it because the way they used to do that the guy would have to go around to the side of the car where the logs were going to dump into the the, uh, the pond the holding pond and knock these chocks out and about once a year somebody would get killed because he wouldn't get out of the way fast enough and the logs would roll off crooked or something uh, so he my grandfather in invented a system where you could knock the chocks out from the other side, <laughs> so nobody got killed anymore. Wow. So that it was it was a simple deal, but uh, hugely important. Yeah. Uh, you know the three clawed uh, gizmo you use to pull weeds in your garden? Yes. He invented that. Did he really? Your grandfather invented that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, well, they, they were all involved with either lumbering or woodworking or. Uh, uh, he, w he would manage the uh, rail car shop for the Union L Lumber Company in Fort Bragg, California. So, And was your father technical too? Uh, he actually was. Um, he wanted to be an aeronautical engineer and when he was about 20 or so, 22, he moved from Fort Bragg to Los Angeles, actually to Burbank, and took a job at Lockheed. 
uh, and that he was going to work and go to school. Well, um, he ended up being a foreman on uh, the, the production line for the P-38 and a number of other airplanes. The Constellation, if you, would, if you remember that, the one that had three, three tails. Sure. Yeah, uh, three vertical stabilizers. Anyway, um, he never got his uh, a degree <laughs> in aeronautical engineering uh, because his brother, who also moved down to LA, uh, had started a, an orthopedic shop. Uh, that made uh, long leg braces and arch supports and back braces and all kinds of orthopedic appliances. And it was doing quite well and he called my dad up and said, my dad's name was Mike, I'm Junior, uh, you've got to come down here and be my partner in this, this orthopedic shop. And so my dad decided to do that and uh, continued doing that until he died. Mm. But uh, the technology involved in building a long leg brace is pretty impressive. Mm. Uh, you have to know metallurgy. You have to know how dis dissimilar metals will wear because you, you can't have the joint wear out in a funny way as you use that brace. Um, you have to get the axis of the brace exactly right mm. to match the axis of your natural Indeed. joint. Uh, and then it has to fit like a glove. Yeah. <laughs> and it's all made from scratch out of stainless steel and uh, different parts that they would bend and weld and put together. And then they had to cover it all with leather so that it was comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really something. It's quite a piece of engineering. Yeah, it's a, and each one's different. Mm. And of course, uh, the Salk vaccine almost killed their business, which is a good thing. Sure. <laughs> you know, yeah. But, but uh, they did uh, a huge business in long leg braces for polio uh, victims. And of course, that the new business stopped, but the old business continued. Uh, People came from all over the country to have my dad build them braces. They wouldn't have anybody else do it. Mm. So, uh, and I'd go down and work there on Saturdays sometimes. So I, I learned a little bit about it. <laughs> so that that ties right into this sort of final part here about engineering being a natural fit for your your interest and talent. It sounds like you came from a family with that kind of background, and also that just fit what you wanted to do? Well, I actually wanted to be a chemist, but uh, uh, I changed my mind about halfway through and decided I, I liked physics and electronics a lot more than chemistry. How was the department at USC when you were there? Was it good? Excellent. Yeah. Really excellent. Um, I, I think the education that engineers get at USC is tops. Um, it's no nonsense. You must, must, must learn how to think. If you, if you can't learn how to think, you're never going to graduate <laughs> from the engineering school. So uh, you get out of there, you have some s uh, sense of confidence that you can solve almost any problem that's solvable. And, uh, because you know how to think it through and how to research it and whatever you have to do. What sorts of choices did you have when you got out of school and what took you to Hughes? Oh, uh, one of my professors at USC was an engineer from Hughes who was getting his PhD and he was teaching a uh, uh, circuits course. His name was Norm Robinson. and. Uh, I took his class and I just loved it. And he was such a good teacher. I didn't have to read the book. I'd just go to class, he would explain it so well that I could work the problems, I could get it. It was, it was great. And uh, he and I just became friendly. Uh, 
And so he got me a job at Hughes Aircraft before I had my bachelor's degree. So I was the youngest member of the technical staff that Hughes had ever had. And I was the only member of the technical staff uh, that didn't have a degree. <laughs> but it was only for like six months and I got my bachelor's. But so you went to work as an undergrad? I did. Okay. I did. And uh, I loved working at Hughes. Uh, they had some of the brightest, most interesting people to work with. And we had really challenging stuff, fire control systems and pretty interesting things that we did. Um, the, uh, the Blackbird is now retired. Uh, do you know the Blackbird yeah, aircraft? Now uh, it's kind of fun because Kelly Johnson designed that airplane at Lockheed where my dad had worked and we built the fire control system for the interceptor version of that airplane which you've never seen. I was going to say I didn't know there was an interceptor there version. There was. There were three of them. And uh, I had the velocity tracker for, for that. A and uh, we designed systems that did things. For example, uh, we could see a signal 20 dB down in the noise. 20 dB down we could track. And we had to do that because the, the closure rate was Mach 6. <laughs> So you had to see it coming from a long <laughs> you had way to away. See it coming from a long way away and a lot of clutter, yeah. and, and uh, I, to this day, some of the things that we accomplished th there, I think, are I don't even know if they're s they're still s top secret or not, <laughs> but they're really impressive. And I loved working there. It was just a great place. And then they, uh, I guess, they liked what I did well enough that they. Uh, uh, put me on the master's fellowship program. So uh, that was a program where you're supposed to work 20 hours a week and go to school 20 hours a week while you get your master's degree. So I did that, but I went to work 40 hours a week <laughs> and went to school 20 hours a week. I, it it didn't, didn't seem like that much of a load to me because and, and, I loved doing what I did at Hughes and I enjoyed the coursework, so I didn't sleep that much. Well, <laughs> so that that's uh, part of the story at Hughes. It was uh, uh, it was a great time. Were you um, were you always working on um, areas of uh, these ver very high specialized? Airplanes like the Blackbird was that primarily what? Yeah, all, all the time I was at Hughes. Um, they also um, put me in charge of the stores, which was uh, you know we would either buy or get free samples from all the different companies of integrated circuits and c specialized capacitors and relays and gosh, uh, you know what? We had a huge, big room and. Uh, that, was, that stuff was used for breadboarding and developing the systems that we developed. Mm -hmm. And they put me in charge of the whole thing, which I thought was really great. How old were you at the time? Uh, this is... Must have been 1964. So what, I, what was I, 20? No, 22. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, we were, exp I was fascinated. We, you know, that was about the time that integrated circuits were just coming out. And so we had the leading edge technology of everything that you could buy for electronics. And of course the sales guys wanted us to have all that stuff because they wanted us to design it in so that they would get a production order. <laughs> and uh, that, was, that was a piece of it that I thought was a lot of fun. Who were you working with for integrated circuits at that time? Um, uh, Fairchild mm -hmm. uh, was a big piece of that. Um, and um, probably probably the, mo the dominant ones. And actually, when, thing, when I first started working at, uh, at Hughes, there weren't integrated circuits. There were uh, 
two N six ninety sevens. I remember. <laughs> yeah. But um, and you know, transistors were just making the transition from germanium to silicon, and the first ideas about uh, integrated circuits were were starting to sprout, and that, you know TTL and DTL and a couple of gates on a on a chip. That was exciting. <laughs> and then was it your job to incorporate those components into new designs too? Yeah. 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 Mo most of the engineers had a chunk of the system. Okay. So, you know, the thing was all pretty much specified, but then there were interfaces from from the velocity tracker to, to the other parts of the fire control system. And uh, that was a very complicated job. You know, it had to go through um, all kinds of uh, testing. We had a, a, a sh what they call a shake table. It was about a 20-ton device that was run with these, by these huge analog vacuum tubes. And it, you could shake a thousand pounds worth of stuff with this thing at any frequency and any amplitude. <laughs> And <laughs> you'd put these these beautiful circuit boards and stuff on there with components sticking up and and you'd use a strobe light at, at the the same frequency as a vibration. <laughs> you could see these things wobbling and <laughs> moving around. But <laughs> they just fall over. <laughs> well, you know, stress test yeah. everything like crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it, it wasn't just design the circuit and make it work. It was Design the circuits, make it work. Design the mechanical configuration it was going to be in, and then make sure that it would withstand humidity and temperature and cycling and vibration, <laughs> everything else. So you had to know a whole gamut of yeah. things to yeah, I was be successful. Yeah, but that made it fun. I mean, yeah. How many people were working on this project? I have no idea. That's part of the secret clearance secret stuff. I, you know, you only know what you need to know. <laughs> and did you have to have a secrecy clearance? Oh yeah, that was one of the, that was the only downside, is I couldn't go home and tell my wife what I was working on. <laughs> you know, I was very proud of some of the stuff I did, but right. can't talk about it. You were at Hughes for a number of years, right? It looks yeah, like four years. Four years. And then you moved to Fairchild. Why did you make that transition? Uh, uh, if, really for all the wrong reasons. Um, but it was the right thing to do. When I got my master's degree uh, in June, I thought, you know, I've been at Hughes for four years and I love that place and I like the people I work with. But I should see what else is available. Why, why not look around a little bit? So I went to one of these um, professional resume uh, designer agencies and put together a resume. And I went to the Sunday paper and I sent out about uh, 90 of them, I think, to RCA, GE, Bell Labs, Space Technology Labs, uh, every company that I thought, well, maybe I enjoy working at that company. And I thought, well, maybe I'll get 10 responses. I think I got 100%. And were the papers filled with classified ads for enge engineers at that point? Uh, uh, well, an en engineer at my age with four years experience, uh, member of the technical staff at, at Hughes was a hot item. I mean, uh, that's why I got so many responses. Yeah. So I spent the whole summer um, flying around the country in some cases and interviewing and uh, got a bunch of offers. But the one that really enticed me was uh, at Space Technology Labs. They offered me a job running all of the satellite launches. I was going to have 400 physicists reporting to me. <laughs> and a salary I couldn't believe. 
and I would be working for uh, the director of the whole uh, labs, who was also the chair of the stock investment committee. Amazing. Or not committee, but the stock investment uh, club they had there. And all of that stuff just, I said, I gotta do this. So I accepted that job. And uh, I hadn't resigned at Hughes yet. That afternoon I get a call from one of the uh, guys that I had worked with at Fairchild in stocking the stores. This was the afternoon that you accepted. Yeah, the yeah. This, is, this is a funny story. Space Technology Labs job. So, uh, matter of fact, you have this fellow's oral history. Jack Gifford is his name. Oh, sure. And Jack says, Mike, you got to come up to, and come to work at Fairchild as a product marketing engineer. And I went, Jack, <laughs> you're crazy. He says, no, 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 you, I mean, you really have to. I said, Jack, I just accepted a job at Space Technology Lab. He says, I don't care. You've got to come up and, and see what this is all about. And, you know, he was a pretty strong guy. And we had become fast friends over the years, actually. And had you put Fairchild on your original Fairchild list? Fairchild wasn't even on my list. Okay. So uh, he said, I'll be at the airport at 5 o'clock. Meet me at the airport, and we're coming up to Mountain View. And you're going to meet some people. Uh, and uh, so I said, you better have a fat wallet, is what I said. <laughs> well, Because you, you were in a great position. You had all the leverage at that point. Yeah, well, I, I thought wrongly that, you know, no matter what I did, I could get a job about that quick. By 1968, there were PhDs pumping gas. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we had this terrible situation. Anyway, this, is, this was 66. Uh, and uh, so I went up and I went uh, through Fairchild a bit, talked to some of the engineers and uh, some of the semiconductor design guys. And then they had a uh, um, kind of a cocktail party going on for something, I forget what for. And so uh, Jack wanted me to go to that, so I did. And I met a guy who you also have, I think, an oral history of, and that's Floyd Kwame. Yes. I just took Floyd's oral history about two months ago. Yeah, well, that's where I met Floyd. And uh, I don't know what it was, but Floyd and I have been very, very good friends ever since. And I went to work for him at Fairchild. <laughs> so then I had three jobs. <laughs> and I hadn't quit. Uh, so you hadn't quit Hughes. Yeah. You'd accepted a second yeah. one and right. taken a third one. Right. So the next day I, went, <laughs> I had to go and and uh, and uh, renege on the job at Space Technology Labs, which I did, and I told Hughes I was going to leave. And, and uh, all of this time, my wife and I had decided to get married. And so uh, I said, do you mind uh, living in Mountain View? <laughs> we were going to be living in Culver City, and we had it all, it all you know, she, oh, of course, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> So uh, I changed jobs and I went into a uh, uh, product marketing job. And I said, you know, if this doesn't work out, no problem. I can always go back uh, and get an engineering job. Well, like I said, I think that was really incorrect. I, I think I'd have had a heck of a time trying to get an engineering job if, uh, if I didn't like product marketing or it hadn't worked out. Now, how was life as a marketing engineer at that point? Oh, I loved it. I just loved it. I had more darn fun, and I was very successful at it because I had enough technical background that the circuit design guys would talk to me. They had, you know, they actually respected my opinion. <laughs> you know, uh, there were a lot of sort of ex salespeople and so on. Uh, the, this was the very beginnings of, of, of Fairchild and product marketing and all that stuff. So uh, it just worked out great for me. And uh, um, I ended up running all of the integrated circuit marketing at Fairchild. 
that was, you know, after Bob and Gordon and Andy left, and uh, Lester Hogan came in to, to run the company. Uh, anyway, uh, here I am. I think I was like 26 years old, and I'm running all the, all the marketing. <laughs> Uh, and Fairchild was booming at that point, wasn't Fairchild it? Fairchild was doing well, and, and uh, I did well. Uh, for example, I, when I went there, I took over linear integrated circuit marketing, and they had a market share of like 17%. Two years later, they had uh, 35%. And, and we put together a marketing program and just blew all the other guys out of the water. What was the key? The key was um, uh, application notes and a series of seminars that we conducted uh, in all the major cities around uh, the United States. It was a two-hour seminar with uh, dual uh, carousel projectors and uh, good uh, circuit design uh, information and how to, how to use the, all the different products that we had. And uh, we would give them a... Uh, actually, there were two three-ring binders full of these application notes, and then we carried samples, tons of samples. So whatever somebody wanted to try out, we'd give them a couple of samples. So they'd have they'd, they'd sit through this thing and they'd learn something, and then they got this set of books to take with them and some samples to go to work with, and it just. The other guys were just flat foot. All the competitors <laughs> were uh, left in the dust. Now, where did you come upon this marketing ability that you discovered in yourself at Fairchild? Uh, well, I went and took a, an uh, American Management Association class in product and brand management, and I just thought I thought the principles made sense, and I just put them all to work. And I read Peter Drucker's books, and and uh, I don't know. <laughs> Self-made. I mean, <laughs> yeah. just you just OJT. OJT. All right, got it. Um, what was life like at Fairchild around Noyce and Moore and and all the people who were uh, there? That's at that where point? I met Bob. Uh, the first time I met Bob, I was shaking in my boots because we had some reliability problems with Zenith. With a, uh, uh, it was actually an IF amplifier that went in, a, in TV sets, and it had a package that we called the Glop Top. <laughs> it, was a, it was a big round thing that had uh, pins on the bottom of it that would fit into a tube socket, so that they could plug it in where tube used to go and it was made out of epoxy and uh, they would just glop the epoxy on top of the whole thing to seal it and it didn't make a good seal and so they were having a high failure rate in highly high humidity uh, locations and so they started doing some testing and uh, uh, I forget what we call them not just ovens, because they, they were temp cycling ovens, but then they had uh, water in them, so they'd go high humidity, and the things would fail like crazy. And the, the uh, president of Zenith came out to talk to us about this and what we were going to do about it, and uh, he wanted to see Bob, and so I had to tell Bob what was going on. And, <laughs> and you, were, you were aware of this at yeah, the time. Yeah, and, and, and that's how I met Bob. And uh, what a great guy. What a great guy. What was he like um, at that point, just at that point at Fairchild? Well, he always had that really deep baritone voice, and he was always calm. Didn't, you know, uh, and uh, you were always confident, whether you were the president of Zenith or a lowly product marketing engineer, uh, you, you could just feel the confidence and believe what he said and take heart that, well, we'll make it right, we'll get it taken care of, <laughs> you know. Uh, he was just that kind of guy. He was probably the most comfortable, comfortable person in his skin that I've ever met. Mm -hmm. Just really uh, great guy. 
we traveled all over the world together. And uh, he could walk into a truck stop bar and sit down next to a trucker, start talking, and the two of them would have a great time for a couple hours. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of guy he is, yeah. was. And then the next morning go into a business meeting and be? Well, or go invent planar technology sure. for integrated circuits. I mean, he was really a, a smart semiconductor physicist, a great guy. And Gordon, were you exposed to Gordon much there at Fairchild? At oh, not very often. Gordon and Andy were pretty much down in the R&D labs, and that was in a, a you know, different location. So I didn't see him very often. You were at Fairchild for? About uh, four years. For about four years, and you were there during the time that Bob decided to leave. Or Bob and Gordon left to to do their own thing. What was that well, like? The first one to leave was was Charlie Spork, right. and Charlie and Floyd went over to National, and uh, then um, sometime after that, Bob, Gordon, and Andy decided to go start Intel, and uh, I think they started Intel in '68. So I had been at Fairchild about two years when they left. Do you remember what that was like? Yeah, I didn't like it very much at all. Uh, at the same time, I, I was uh, not because I was trying to, but I was rising very fast up through the ranks at Fairchild. And so I was being very successful in my own, in my own estimation. And, and uh, even though I didn't like some of the things that were going on there, uh, it wasn't hurting me uh, at the time, but I could see the writing on the walls you know, at some point if that continued, that we'd lose all the good people and then what do you have? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what it was like, uh, for me anyway. Since you could see the handwriting on the wall, was it, was it, did, did it cause you to really look closely at what was happening at Intel and National and other places and try to think about what you were going to do next? Well, um, n not too much. Okay. I, I had a view of keep your nose to the grindstone and, and do your job and do it well and let, let the chips fall wh where they may. And uh, I kind of did that. Uh, Jack Gifford left and uh, I helped him write the business plan for AMD. Uh, and Jerry Sanders got fired, remember? <laughs> so he and Jack got together to do AMD, and they wanted me to come there, and I said, no way. <laughs> but I didn't think that was a, a good move. <laughs> so I was just, uh, like I said, I had my nose to the grindstone. I was doing the best job I could do for Fairchild. And then when uh, Bob and, and Gordon and, and uh, Roger Borovoy at Intel uh, decided that they needed some product marketing done. Uh, they actually hired a guy by the name of Bob Graham. I don't think you knew Bob. Uh, and uh, Bob called me up. Bob, Bob and Don Valentine had worked together at Fairchild in the early days and didn't care much for one another. Anyway, um, Bob just called me up one day out of the blue and said, we need, some, we need what you know how to do. Would you consider coming to work at Intel? <laughs> and I said, yeah, <laughs> I would. <laughs> but why were you so quick to do that? Um, that was two years later. Um, it was about 19, late 1969 or early 70. And, uh, uh, Fairchild was just um, leaking talent. The good people were going to Intel or National or Motorola or someplace, but uh, the environment at, at Fairchild was not conducive to attracting good people or keeping the ones that we had. And that's not to say there weren't some great folks there like Wilf Corrigan and a few others that, that I uh, really admired and respected. 
but they weren't up to the challenge. So uh, for me to go to work for Bob, uh, that didn't take, that didn't, that was a no-brainer. <laughs> <laughs> How big was Intel at that point? Oh, tiny, yeah. tiny. They had just uh, built the first 1101s, which was a 256-bit memory chip. <laughs> 256 <laughs> bits. bits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they were still messing around trying to decide whether they're going to go with MOS or bipolar. Huh. So uh, that was that was something. What was the what was the vibe of the company at that point? Intel? Yes. Uh, they were still in R&D lab that's what they what it felt like there they didn't really have a sales department <laughs> to speak of uh, they did have a sales manager but uh, that was about it and uh, when I got there I said uh, to the, the uh, they, they had a department called shipping and customer service mm -hmm. and it was run by a, a young lady and I said, well, what's the backlog? She said, what? <laughs> I said, well, don't we have a list of orders or something? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and indeed, uh, she did, but it was all handwritten uh, uh, in an accounting pad. Yeah. And I went, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's, where it that's what it felt like. It felt like an R&D lab. And, it didn't feel like a semiconductor company. So what was the product marketing, the new product marketing guy going to do uh, coming into that environment? Well, develop, just uh, for starters, basic blocking and tackling. How about a data sheet? Yeah. <laughs> for, for, the for the new 156-bit. <laughs> yeah, for, for uh, this 256-bit. Uh, memory. Memory chip. Uh, and what kind of other things do our customers want us to build and can we ever get to a penny a, a bit so we can compete with core and uh, on and on and on and on. Yeah. So there was, there was plenty to do. How did, uh, how did the, the top execs at Intel, Noyce and Moore and Grove, how did they view marketing at that point? Um, I don't think Gordon had much of a opinion one way or another. Um, I think Andy thought it was completely superfluous, and uh, Bob uh, had a great appreciation for it. I think so. I think they all they were quite different. What was the first thing that really worked after you after you went to Intel? How did it begin to? Um, well, the the very first thing that worked uh, extremely well and stands out. This is not to say there weren't other things that worked too. Was the uh, 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 EEPROM, the double EEPROM, that's what's called the 1601. It was the f world's first electronically erasable uh, and then programmable read-only memory, and uh, it was a huge success f for Intel. And we made a lot of money on that product. Then we did a four-bit um, four uh, microprocessor chipset for calculators that we sold to a c company in Japan. And the busy, the busycom. Busycom, that's right. Product. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I do. Uh, and were you able to build marketing the way that you wanted to build it at that point? Because you really were the the lead marketing uh, person. Well, not only did I have marketing, I had all shipping, and forecasting, and customer services, that whole back end, and. Uh, product planning, product uh, the, that part on the front end, and forecasting. So I had Andy, who was supposed to be the manufacturing guy, uh, kind of in a, in between. <laughs> and Andy, was, he would get so mad at me. 
And I, you know, I'd get him to agree to a, a certain number of products, uh, certain quantities that were supposed to be built, because I had all the order backlog and all that stuff. And uh, he'd say, yeah, I can build it, and I can ship it, and then he'd have a yield problem, or something else would go wrong, and he wouldn't be able to. And of course, I'm the first guy to point that out, because I've got the order, on, and the customer sitting at my desk want to know where his parts are. <laughs> And so uh, it, that was embarrassing to Andy when, he, when the factory didn't do what it was supposed to do. And Andy's not the kind of guy that likes to ever be embarrassed. <laughs> so uh, he, he and I had, had some knockdown drag outs uh, over that kind of stuff. So you were the guy who continually had to break the bad news somehow, or you had to deliver the customer's dissatisfaction to Andy. Well, yeah. And yeah. <laughs> You know, it wasn't that I was mad at Andy. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's just here's the issue. We have to resolve it. We got to uh, put some more, start some more wafers, or do something to get this guy out of the out of the bind. But uh, <coughs> I enjoyed uh, every minute that I worked at Intel. It was, in particular, I liked the uh, microprocessors and what started out as what's called the 1201, uh, which ended up being the 8008. Um, and I still have a photomicrograph about the size of that poster over there of the uh, 8008 that I think is really fun to have. <laughs> Could you see at the time, was it clear to you this roadmap and this kind of amazing progression that Intel in particular as a company was going to make as this, as the science of semiconductors became more and more advanced and the demand was building for it. Yeah, we weren't quite to the point yet of a system on the chip. And uh, th that's, I could always see that. As a matter of fact, I remember a cartoon. That it, was a, it was a picture of a little, a little quarter inch chip with these huge foot diameter cables coming on both sides, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I was just thinking, well, what are you gonna do? <laughs> To, to interact with these things if you uh, have to have all these wires coming in and going out. But the answer to that is you, you have uh, pretty simple things, uh, an input and an output, and it can be very complicated in, in between if you have everything you need for the system there. Yeah. So uh, to me it was just, yep, you know, Moore's law makes sense. What are we going to do with all those tr all those devices on the chip, and multiple uh, technologies on the same chip, so we can do uh, EEPROMs on the same chip that we do the microprocessor and s so on. And that's where we are today. Just gazillions of devices on the chip. Right, and it was all moving in that direction. Yeah. at the very beginning when you were there. Yeah. Did you continue to have a relationship with Noyce also? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, there's something that's not on your, your sheet here. There's a, a ski company called Volant Skis that was started in 1982 by uh, Hank and Bucky Cashua. Hank was the 1978 world champ uh, skier downhill, you know, and uh, I'll make a long story short. Uh, uh, Bucky uh, was getting his PhD in, uh, at the University of Seattle, but the interesting thing was he was the chief designer at K2 and made all the skis for John Claude Keeley and for his brother Hank, and uh, really a brilliant, brilliant guy. And he had invented a totally new and different ski technology. And uh, I got to know them through John Claude Keeley because I used to ski with him <laughs> uh, once a year. Anyhow, um, I met with, with Bucky and Hank and, and I took one look at the technology, what he had done, and he, he had made a, a ski that was a torsion box. The whole ski was a torsion box. The top was a piece of stainless steel shaped 
like that, and then there was a bottom steel, and then you hooked them together. And so the ski is a torsion box. So super stiff, torsionally, yeah. and nice and soft, longitudinally. And talk about ski and hold an edge. Oh, man, it's just the best skis I've ever skied on. So uh, I got Bob and Arthur, and the three of us each put in $5,000 <laughs> to start full on ski company. <laughs> and uh, the 15 grand was to buy some, some uh, roller equipment so that Bucky could make up a whole bunch of test pairs in his garage. <laughs> How did that work? Um, it was eventually sold to a company in Canada uh, who then sold it to Atomic. And they're still building uh, skis based on that technology. Wow. But they're, uh, uh, they've made some small changes. They're gr still good skis. I, I ski on them. Was that your first foray into venture investing? No, Bob talked me into one before that. Uh, it was a, uh, a company on the East Coast that had invented a way to do ice storage uh, for uh, uh, power so that you could buy electricity when it was cheap and then use it when it wasn't cheap because you had stored all that energy in these tanks that were full of this chemical that froze and uh, worked good but the company <laughs> never got off the ground. Trying to sell something to the utilities is uh, not easy. Very tough. You mentioned Arthur Rock and yeah. Arthur was very much a fixture around Intel, wasn't he? Oh absolutely. What was, what, was, what was Arthur doing at that point when you were there? He was on the uh, board of directors and uh, I had met Arthur at Fairchild, but we would never spent any time together. But at Intel, since I was doing the forecasting and shipping and all that other stuff, uh, it was common for the board to ask me to come and give them a status at each board meeting. And so I would, I would come up and do my, my presentation, or whatever you want to call it, uh, to the board, and Arthur would be there. And about half the time, he would go to sleep while I was talking. <laughs> he wasn't interested in any of that part of it. But, uh, uh, and then I learned a trick from him. He, he, he didn't like to do that. So he would take a caffeine pill so that he didn't get so sleepy. <laughs> was it the marketing that he wasn't interested in? Uh, no, the details of the shipping and the forecasting and then this product and that. Uh, he doesn't yeah. get into that stuff. He doesn't, he doesn't care about it. But we became pretty good friends, and uh, I've known him ever since. You know. Did the caffeine pill trick work? Yeah. 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 It's, it's about the same as drinking a couple of cups of coffee. Yeah. Today we call it five-hour energy, I guess. I, yeah, I, don't, I think it's the same thing. That kind of thing. Uh, and so then in 1975, at the age of 32, you retire. 74, I think. 74. Yeah. What led you to make that decision? Well, I I every year around Christmas time, I would uh, take stock of my net worth and where I was. And I had, uh, I had set a goal to be financially independent so that I could do what I wanted to do and not have to work for a company or so on. And uh, two years earlier, I did that little exercise, and I had far surpassed the goal. And I said, I'm not quitting. I'm having too much fun. <laughs> and so I, I said, OK, I'm just going to take my time, and I'm going to give some thought to what would I do if I was retired. And so for the next two years, I developed a list of 52 things that I wanted to do uh, and uh, it was really getting exciting to me to do. And so uh, two years later I resigned and 
set about doing those things on my list. So you could start on the list of 52. Yeah. yeah. It, Intel, by the way, th this just I wanted to remark on this for a minute, uh, was quite focused, wasn't it, on employee equity and giving people a stake in the company and really having everybody sharing the financial success of uh, Yeah, yeah, and Intel. it created a lot of problems. Th they were really uh, a pioneer yeah. in that regard. And um, believe me, I copied every bit of it at Apple. What were the problems that it created? Um, well, a, um, a line worker, for example, with a stock option had no idea how that worked or what it really meant. And <laughs> we had to literally teach classes in what it means to own stock in the company and to ha why is it different to have an option than owning the stock directly? And do you want to participate in the employee stock purchase plan where you could buy stock for 15% less than its market value at the time you bought it? And why was that a good idea? <laughs> oh, gee whiz. But uh, once we got over those humps and employees understood that they were actually owning part of the company, it did what it was supposed to do, which was to align everybody's thinking it, to the best interests of the shareholders. And uh, of course, it's kind of out the window today because of some of the things that our government has done. But um, I still think it's the very, very best way to run a company. If you didn't have to expense the options, it, it would be good. Mm -hmm. So let's get back to your list of 52. Now, you're retired from Intel. You have your list of 52. What are the things that are on your list at that point? I'll just give you a few. Um, some of them are kind of frivolous, but they were important to me. Uh, one of them was I'd been playing the guitar for almost 20 years, and I never learned how to read music. So I wanted to do that. So I went down to the l music store on De Anza Boulevard, <laughs> and I started taking the lessons from one of the guys in there who was a guitar player, and I learned how to read music. Um, I wanted to put something back, so uh, I went down and got on the Cupertino Planning Commission. So I was a planning commissioner for two years. Uh, and I actually enjoyed that. It was rewarding. And, and uh, I met some pretty interesting people like John Sobrato <laughs> and others. Was uh, he just starting out at that point? Yeah. And he was one of the guys that was presenting, you know, to build buildings and things. And I'm on the planning commission. <laughs> he tells some funny stories about that. Um, uh, I went down to Regnart School, grammar school on uh, Bub Road, and uh, said, I have a master's degree in double E, and I can teach math. Would you like to have me come and teach math? And they said, yes. So I did that for a couple of years. Um, I, love, I love building furniture and I'm working with wood, so I, was, I would build chairs and tables and stuff in my garage. Uh, uh, there were a lot of things. And then I noticed in the movie, Something Ventured, you said that one day a week. Now, every Monday. You would help a young company. I would, yeah, whoever wanted to call me up and have me help them in whatever way I could, I did for free. What were some examples of things you were doing uh, during oh, that period? One guy was building a soap company. <laughs> uh, there were uh, several semiconductor companies who w called and uh, would ask me to, to evaluate their business plan or, or uh, help in other ways. And uh, <laughs> there were a couple of them that said, well, you just might as well come to work here. <laughs> I said, no, no, <laughs> this is Monday, <laughs> not Tuesday and Wednesday. And so uh, I managed to, to not do one of those kind of things. Was it satisfying to you to just that one day yeah, a week help yeah, someone Yeah, it out? was because what I missed, what I found out I missed was bright, fiery-eyed, fire-in-the-belly people with, you know, wanting to accomplish things. And uh, that gave me the, a way to, to interact with, with people like that. And, uh, 
I enjoyed it a lot. I, that's why I kept doing it. So let's turn now to your getting introduced to Jobs and Wozniak. Uh, there are so many versions of the story about how this happened, and I would just like for you to take me through how this came about and who was responsible for it. Well, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, Steve Jobs uh, had worked at Atari. Um, he was trying to find some money to build those 50 boards that he had sold and he needed to buy parts for. And so he knew Nolan Bushnell. So he went to Nolan and said, Nolan, how, you know, how can I get financing? And, and uh, um, Don Valentine had financed Atari. So Nolan said, why don't you go talk to Don Valentine? And Don knew that I was doing this every Monday, uh, help people out thing. Uh, so he went over to see the two Steves, and I, I think you heard <laughs> his view of that from from the uh, something ventured. But uh, he came out of there saying uh, he didn't want to have anything to do with. The he table. didn't find them very appealing at all. No, and uh, someplace in the middle of all this, they had Steve had gone up to visit with Arthur too. And Arthur was the same way. He just, uh, you know. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Well, these are two people you knew and whose opinions you respected. Yeah. So Don just called me up one day and said, hey, there's two guys over in this garage in Los Altos who could really use the kind of help you provide. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you ought to go see them. So I said, fine. S so uh, he gave me a phone number. I called it. And Steve answered the phone. I said uh, who I was. and. Uh, when could I come over and talk to him? Uh, and it was the next day or so. Uh, uh, I went over and met them in the garage. And I saw what uh, Waz had done and what he was working on. And uh, I went, uh oh. <laughs> why did why did cool. you why did you say that? Uh, well, for years, I had. Uh, started out with the, the old IBM, I think it was called the 1600. It was a Fortran programmable box that sat on a desk. And uh, I'd always had fun programming, uh, whether it was Fortran or BASIC or who, who cares what. And part of the thing that I did at Intel was I wrote the whole order processing system. And I did that on Timeshare. You wrote the software for it. Yeah, the whole thing. And I used I used uh, Timeshare uh, PDP 11s that they had over on Bub Road. Remember, remember the Timeshare buildings on Bub Road. And I did it that way because I could stop by on my way home, <laughs> and rebuild the disk drives and do whatever else I had to do to keep the whole thing running. But that's how we kept the, both the forecast. Intel and all the shipping information, the backlog and, and uh, schedules and all that. Um, and that ran on a Model 33 teletype. You remember those? So we had a Model 33 teletype at Intel, and I had a Model 33 teletype in my little office at home. <laughs> and. Uh, we're going to get to it later, I suppose. But one of the things I wrote for Apple was a checkbook program. Well, I used to balance my checkbook on the PDP-11. <laughs> and so I knew exactly what, it had, what you needed to, to do. Um, and I had been using a ridiculously powerful computer to do the kinds of things that I could see you could do with the Apple II. And so, to me, it was a no-brainer. I, I was way ahead of it. And uh, when we did the 1201 and, uh, and the 8008 and then the 8080, I was just going like this. Why, aren't we, why don't we go ahead and put them in a box so that you can uh, do something with it? And of course, the, the reason was it was way too expensive then. Uh, and nobody had the brilliant idea of using your home television set for the display. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that took a huge cost out of it. Right. 
So, uh, so you saw this. When this I saw what Boss had done, sitting there in that garage using an ordinary home TV, and they had color graphics even, and basic and warm. Integer basic, albeit, you know, it wasn't floating point, but integer basic and ROM. Uh, oh, man. What was the I display what like? This. What, would, what was the display like when you saw it? Uh, what, were the, what was on the screen, do you remember? I can't remember what was on the screen, but I knew, knew you know, I had Waz show me what it could do, and there yeah. were eight colors, and, and uh, there was low res graphics and high res graphics. I don't know if you remember that. But Mm -hmm. With the little quarter inch squares were one thing, and then, then there was uh, a pixel bit based uh, mm -hmm. graphics. Mm -hmm. And uh, gee, many Christmas. So, a lot of the things that you'd, you'd imagined at Intel and that you were even working on with this home checkbook program suddenly all kind of flashed. Before yeah, to your me, eyes. it was just like, oh, good, this is, uh, this is great. You know? Yeah. <laughs> So I, my plan was to encourage them, and uh, I told them I'd help them write a business plan, and if the business plan was any good, I'd try to help them uh, raise some money, because I knew a few venture capitalists, you know. So that was uh, what I told them, and they didn't say yay or nay at that point, but then they called up later and said, yeah, we'd like you to help us write the business plan. I'm gonna, before, we, before we go there, I want to go back just one step, which was that, uh, you know, the Today, to hear Valentine and, and Rock tell the story, it really has a lot more to do with them just not being um, sort of conventional people, Jobs and Wozniak at that point. I mean, there's the whole bit about Jobs not bathing and having long hair and being rude. and All true. And Wozniak. Uh, and, but you, did that bother you? It didn't seem to bother you the way it sort of bothered them and made them say, I don't want to have anything to do with these guys. Uh, it didn't bother me. I, they were young, malleable, uh, and at that point I wasn't going to be part of it. I was going to help them write a business plan and, and see what we could do with that, and that would be that. That's, that's what I did. I wasn't going to be running off to spend the next 20 years of my life <laughs> <laughs> building a company. So uh, so for you, it was, a, it was another Monday project, and these yeah. guys were who they were. And right, and I loved the Apple II. I just absolutely loved the Apple II. Yeah. I just thought it was a brilliant piece of engineering. The circuit design was elegant. Um, you know, the Apple II, II, as it was, when I walked in there, was the world's first single board computer. The world's first. All the other computers that were made with 8008s and all the other stuff were multiple boards that were, you know, put together with connectors and stuff. Mm -hmm. It was the world's first uh, computer that used semiconductor uh, RAM. It was the world's first single board computer that had slots, had eight slots that you could plug in other things. Um, it was the world's first computer that had BASIC and ROM. Uh, it was probably the only computer that's ever been built that had a built-in 16-bit microprocessor simulator in ROM. Uh, I, I, I could go on. Mm -hmm. it, it, uh, this was one elegant beautifully crafted design that Waz had done. And uh, I'm a circuit designer. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, I wasn't worried about that part of it. And the, uh, the jump to use the, uh, the owner's own TV that he already has as a display to keep the cost down, that was brilliant. Um, at that point, uh, there was no Rod Holt involved, so there was no um, uh, switching power supply, uh, which is another major, major piece that made the Apple II a fantastic product. Did they know what they had at that point? No. I don't think they did. Yeah. 
they were just having fun. And Woz just wanted his own computer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Simple as that. And turned out to be exceptional at the way he could design these things. Uh, and and uh, Woz did it again uh, when I asked him to build a, a, a DOS, the uh, disk operating system for the floppy. Yeah. That little that little card today is impressive. There's not an extra bit anywhere in that design. <laughs> None. And it did everything superbly. From the time that you first met them and you saw you had this kind of revelation and you said you just offered to help and they didn't say anything at the time, what was the passage of time before they called you back and said, yeah? I we'll think they called the next day and said, you know, okay. but we'll, we'll, try, we'll do a business plan and uh, when can we get together? And really uh, wasn't was that was going to do, it was Steve that was supposed to do the business plan. Yeah. And uh, I said, fine, I forget what schedule we did. We committed to some evenings. Uh, and uh, I, I lived in Cupertino and we had this little uh, cabana out in the back, which was a good place for us to sit and talk and work out the details. So uh, we spent quite a bit of time. And then I would, uh, give Steve the list of things that he needed to do and then come back with the what it done and he never would do that. <laughs> so you Just you were the driver of the whole process. You had to be because yeah. you knew what you were doing. Yeah. And, and uh, I kept giving him what but it was pretty obvious that uh, the neither one of them had any interest in writing a business plan. They just didn't want to do it. So I finally said, well, okay, I'll write a business plan because I really wanted to see this thing go. And uh, in the process of doing that, I came to the conclusion that we could build a Fortune 500 company in less than five years. And I thought, you know, that would be really fun. Yeah. <laughs> it had never been done before. With no, with no market really to scope at that point because there had never been anything like this computer before, how? Did you know that you could do that? I just knew it. Um, and one of the things I said then was that uh, there would be more personal computers in people's homes than telephones. And guess what? It's true today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you had to have some faith that the two of them could do the things you needed for them to do if you started to build a company. How, how did you come to the conclusion that, that you could count on them? They were young, uh, motivated guys. Uh, did they have that fire in the belly you were looking for? Well, certainly Steve Jobs did. Um, was was very reluctant. He didn't want to quit his job at HP. Uh, and I said, well, look, we're not doing this unless you're fully committed. And you know, he said, well, I can work part-time. No, <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't work either. And uh, so finally, he decided he would be part of it. And uh, I knew that if I was going to go on, well, I haven't got to that point yet. But, uh, at one point, I decided that if it was going to happen, I had to go do the marketing because I didn't think I knew anybody else on the planet that understood what it was going to take to introduce personal computing to the world. <laughs> and so, and I told the story a lot of times. I said, if you walk down the street in 1976 and stopped 100 people and ask them if they'd like a personal computer, the most common answer would be a what? <laughs> and. Uh, so that's where we were starting. As you were in this really intense period from late 76 to the incorporation of Apple in early 77, were you talking to other people like, like Valentine or Rock or people in, who would say, you know, I think we may have really a tiger by the tail here? No, the only person I talked to at that point was Hank Smith. Hank Smith had worked for me at Intel. Um, he was the guy that actually introduced the 8080. Um, and 
just a brilliant, brilliant guy. And I'll just tell you this little story. It shouldn't be part of this thing. Okay. But uh, at some point you might interview Peter Crisp or Hank Smith. There was a board member on the board at Intel named Hank Smith. He was the representative of Venrock Associates. That Hank Smith and my Hank Smith just hit it off. And both from the East Coast, uh, my Hank Smith kind of always wanted to move back to the East Coast. Uh, he and his wife, Kathy, um, liked that environment better than California. And uh, they became close friends. And then the Intel Hank Smith found out he had terminal cancer. So he went to Venrock and told them that my Hank Smith should be his replacement at Venrock. And that relationship bloomed and developed. And when the Intel Hank Smith died, my Hank Smith went to work at Venrock. Mm. And we were very close. And, and I loved working with Hank. And he, he worked for me f at Fairchild. And then I hired him from Fairchild to come to work at Intel because uh, I thought so much of him. And uh, so since he was the Venrock guy now, I just called him up one day and said, Hank, I'm doing this. I don't need any money. If you want to play, fine, we'll take some of your money. <laughs> if you don't, that's fine. Why don't you come out and take a look? And uh, so he did. And uh, he, was, he was the first board member that I recruited. And uh, so they put 300 grand in. <laughs> it's a great story. Yeah. But I, like I said, it doesn't belong on this, this piece, but okay. it's, it's one you can stick away in the corner for later. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good to know. Thank you, Mike. Um, so somehow you got the business plan written. Yeah. It, and you're kind enough to donate it. No, I haven't given it to anybody. You guys oh, don't have it. We, I guess we have the first offering statement. You, right? have, you, have, a, you have bits and pieces of it that, were, pieces. that were used in the offering. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, and and then what? How did the initial investment happen, and and how did you kick it off? And and how how did you know these two these two guys, Jobs and Wozniak, who were not really tutored in business at all at that point? How how did they and you come together and decide? Okay, the business plan's ready. Now we're going to go form a company um, and get started. Well, when we finally got to that point, I said to the two of them that here's the way we're going to do it. Each of us is going to have 26%. So any two of us can throw the other one out. So we have some confidence that if somebody goes off the deep end, we can, we can uh, uh, take care of that. And the rest of it will be used for stock options and rec recruiting uh, top, top line talent. And uh, they, they, they thought that was a pretty good plan. Mm. So I, I had that part set up. Um, I went and talked to a guy that had worked for me again at Fairchild, who then left Fairchild during the Great Exodus and went to National. And uh, his name is Mike Scott. And he's a Caltech physics grad. Uh, just a really, really brilliant guy. And uh, fun to work with. Uh, and, and our birthdays are on the same day. Mm. But I'm a year and a day older than he is because of leap year. <laughs> so anyway, he's, uh, we used to go, go to lunch every year on our birthday. So uh, in uh, 77, uh, I'd ask Mike if he would entertain the idea of coming over and being CEO because I knew that he could manage Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and uh, he would do a great job and I wouldn't have to worry about the manufacturing end of it because he, he was just really good at that stuff. Uh, he knew every resistor and capacitor that was out on that line uh, at any point in time. <laughs> He's one of those guys. Uh, and he did a great job with the two Steves. Uh, and so that freed me up to really go worry about marketing. 
and uh, that was enough for for Scotty, believe me. <laughs> and you said I, I read this interesting part about uh, the titles. I mean, he's the president working for you as the chairman, but you're the VP of marketing working for Scott, the president. How right. We did that on purpose. That's very interesting. How did that work? It worked great, and it sent a real message to every employee. It doesn't matter what your title is. It matters what you're doing and how you work with everybody else. And uh, you know, we have to have a chairman. Oh, good, he'll be chairman. <laughs> we got to have a CEO. He's CEO. <laughs> so. Uh, and Waz was still designing the product, and Steve was doing what? Uh, Steve was worrying about uh, getting the case to work because we had huge problems with the uh, molds. And we'd get the lids in, and they'd be warped, and, and uh, so there was a lot. There was plenty for everybody to do. Uh, and were you also putting the board together at that point too? Uh, um, yeah, but that was pretty well laid out by the time we, uh, by the first part of '77, mm -hmm. and uh, we had to do the power supply. So we hired Rod Holt, who, who designed the power supply, which was another brilliant piece of engineering. It really, you know, for its, for its weight and size and uh, highly efficient, so we didn't have to have a fan. It's a great power supply. Um, and it was an, enough capacity that you could plug in all, stuff in all eight of those slots and power all that. So, uh, tremendous design, just absolutely superb. Where was Rod Holt? <sighs> Not sure. I think he had uh, left Atari. I think he was at Atari. Were you the one who found him? No, Steve Jobs uh, found him. Uh, Al Alcorn recommended him, yeah. I think, is the way that went. Um, anyway. Uh, he agreed to come and, and, and do the power supply, and he did. He's quite a, he's a personality, I'll tell you. <laughs> and then you talked about, as you're getting ready to go to market in the West Coast Computer Fair and sort of unveil it, that you, you were the one who asked Waz to build the disk drive, right? Because yeah. you realized tape was too slow. Well, no, tape was just horribly unreliable. And I mean, you're not you're, you weren't going to put a lot of work and effort into anything, and not be able to get it back. So, and as soon as you turn the power off, it's gone. Yeah. You know, so. And was was Waz the kind of engineer that you could just walk in and say, "I need to do this. I think this is a good idea," and he'd start to work on it right away? For me, yeah, uh, but I don't know if that was true for other people. He, he was. We always just got along, just great. I always liked Waz, and I, I, I think he returns the favor. Was the West Coast Computer Fair the key moment for the introduction of the Apple II? It really was. It really was. And uh, um, I told Steve Jobs, I said, I want the best booth in the house, and we're going to do this up brown. And, and uh, we did. You couldn't. Miss us. When you walked in that front door to the computer fair, all you could see was Apple. <laughs> 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 and we, we had what everybody at that place wanted to see. Oh boy, look what they've done. Ooh, <laughs> I want one of those. So this was really very user driven, wasn't it? I mean, you were going directly to people who you knew would be wild about the Apple II and showing it to yeah, them. Well, that's directly. what the business plan said. There's nobody going to buy one of these things who isn't already a hobbyist, quote unquote, geek, which there weren't geeks then, right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so the market, to begin with, was 100% the kind of folks that went to the uh, homebrew computer club. And there was a bunch of them in Boston. There were, I mean, th there was enough market to get us going. Yeah. And uh, so we just rifle shot to the hobby market. Didn't, we didn't think anything about anything else. And did you hit your goals hmm? for that? Did you, did you hit the sales goals for that first? Uh, we hit the business plan month by month 
for the first 12 months within like $5,000. And it said that we would have net retained earnings in September. We did. Uh, one of the things I did was instead of just putting the money in, I just uh, uh, took out a line of credit with the Bank of America for a quarter of a million. And uh, if we needed it all, fine, we needed it, but if we didn't, it wouldn't get used. But I made a deal with the Bank of America guys who I'd known from Intel and other places. I said, I want us to be treated like we've been with Bank of America for 10 years. I want you to hold our feet to the fire. I'll make sure we make our payments on time. On, and everything that we do needs to be like a grown-up real company. Why did you do that? Because they didn't do that then. They, they, wouldn't, they treated a startup like, uh-oh, we don't really want to do business with them. Mm. And I said, I want a banking relationship. I don't want a, you know, your typical startup banking relationship. Uh, and they agreed. They, so they, you know, they got copies of the business plan. They were checking to make sure we were doing what we were supposed to do. And I wanted that. I wanted, a, I wanted us to act like a big company, even though we weren't yet. And uh, that's that probably had a certain, applied a certain discipline on the operation of the business that you were looking well, for. It did, too, and didn't. that's what I wanted. And uh, <laughs> you, you probably don't know this. All of the orders we took for the first six months were cash in advance. <laughs> we, we would trade the guy, he'd give us a check and we'd give him a number to say that computer will be built in August 10th, <laughs> you know, whatever it was. And we did that for quite a while. So that was a cash business from the very beginning. Uh, that's why we had net retained earnings in September. This was a whole new model, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. A whole new model, a new product, a new user base, a new way to buy the product. I mean, hobbyists, I suppose, had been accustomed to doing things a certain way for a while, but, uh, but not in these volumes, right? Not in these numbers. Yeah, and not something that ready to use out of the box. Now, there was a company called Heathkit where sure. you, you could buy all the parts and make a stereo. <laughs> and, and at the same time, you were you were writing software, weren't you? Were you were you writing software during this period as Johnny Appleseed, or did that come a little later? Yeah, no, I I did that right away. Yeah. Um, Why did you do that? Because I wanted people to see that you could do something useful with with, with an Apple II. So I wrote three three programs. One was called Color Math, which was good for young kids to learn how to add and subtract. And uh, one was called Finance, which did everything that the HP financial calculator did. Mm -hmm. It would do internal rate of return, and calculate an amortization schedule, and all that stuff. By the way, these all had to run in 4K bytes of RAM. <laughs> That's efficient. Four K <laughs> bytes. <laughs> yeah, you know, an icon today is 128. I know. Four thousand bytes. And then the last one you already mentioned, which is uh, a checkbook balancing program. Okay. Okay. Did, uh, how widely known was it that you were Johnny Appleseed? I don't think anybody knew that. I just did it. Did you ever? Did the company ever get calls? Uh, anyone ever inquire and say, "Hey, that, that Johnny Appleseed writes pretty good software. Who is that?" I guy? don't know if they did. I didn't get any. <laughs> <laughs> I still have a uh, uh, Appleseed Labs website that I mess with once in a while. I didn't know that Appleseed Labs. That's yeah. really nice. I got to take it down actually because uh, the stuff that's on it now it runs an OS nine. I haven't messed with it for a while. So, how, uh, what you hoped would come true came true, r because you went from, uh, you didn't hope, you saw, what you saw would come true did come true, from $170,000 in sales to a billion dollars in annual sales in five years. What was that like? What was it like being on that kind of a rocket? Well, um, 
from day one, Scotty and I sat down and said, we have to grow at an astounding rate and get large enough so that when IBM enters the, the market, they don't just squash us like a bug. So you feared IBM from the beginning? Yes. And um, we knew we had to grow just as fast as we could grow. So we, we made all kinds of interesting decisions based on that. For example, both Scotty and I had worked for companies who uh, plateaued because their IT system wouldn't handle, wouldn't handle growing faster. So they'd have to s slow down and replace the IT system and replace the order processing system, and then they could go on. So we said, we're not going to do that. So we put in a billion dollar uh, capability uh, order processing system that would handle multiple distribution channels, multiple co commission structure for salespeople. Um, it was all there. So we never, we never had to stop. We, di we didn't b hit the, the ceiling. And uh, we said, there is no way we're going to be able to use classical management techniques. We could figure that at any point in time, less than half the employees would have been there in more than six months. Well, you got to, I mean, if you're growing that fast. Yeah. Uh, so we said we have to have a different scheme, a different uh, technique for managing these people. How rapidly were you hiring? No, oh, we we would. Geez, we, we more than doubled every year. Uh, we were behind the good earth. We had about thirty people, and we moved to Banley Drive. When we moved in there, half the building was completely empty. We had ping pong tables, and uh, we had about one hundred and twenty. And by the end of that year, that building was completely full. We had squished up the cubicles. And we had two or three buildings across the street, and we still had <laughs> the original uh, facility behind the good earth. We kept trying to get rid of it, and it'd be full of people. We didn't have any place to put them. So, <laughs> so what we came up with, uh, we call it management by values. And we said we're going to develop what Apple values are, and we're going to make sure we hire people that share those values, and. Then we're not going to have to look over their shoulder and make sure they're doing it all right and make sure that they're um, implementing what we what the vision is. And uh, an example of that is um, we put out a, a magazine, Apple Magazine. We probably got a bunch of them here. Um, we could have put that out on um, newspaper print, newspaper paper. Um, no colors, we could have done it black and white. Uh, but nobody had to say to the guy that was doing that, who was Phil Royball, you may, you may have him on one of these. Uh, he knew full color, not two color, full color, good quality paper, well written, uh, make it worthwhile so that people will actually read it. And uh, that's part of Apple values. It, it was just never. Uh, never discussed. <laughs> and uh, nobody had to go to Phil and say, make, make it a full color. So Apple values were super helpful. And uh, we, we would go over those with poten potential employees and say, this is, what, this is what we care about. And if you don't like these, then you probably shouldn't come to work here. And we say, by the way, if you're the kind of person that gets angry when your cubicle shrinks over the weekend, you probably ought not to be here either. <laughs> <laughs> and was that new to the to Silicon Valley that that ethos? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Intel had a bit of it. They had the egalitarian uh, culture there, um, which I thought was a bit stifling, actually. Um, I think I think the management by values worked extremely well for Apple. It really worked well. We had a guy by the name of Mike Vance. He's the person who originally came up with the phrase, think out of the box. And you can get his books. He's written a, 
probably half a dozen books. And he was the uh, guy who built Disney University, changed the, uh, the culture at, Dis at, the, at the theme parks, uh, that their customers are not customers, they're guests, and the place ought to be spick and span clean. Uh, so every one of those people that works at, at, at Disneyland has been through that training class. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's part of what makes Disneyland Disneyland. Very smart guy. So we uh, asked him to help us. And, and uh, of course, when we first did the values, we had uh, honesty and integrity and uh, all those kinds of words, which mean nothing to anybody anymore. And Mike was very helpful in in changing that, the way we words, worded the values, to things like we're all on an adventure together. We're going to be a good citizen in every locale where we have a facility. Now, it's a whole different uh, way of, of describing it. Yeah. And he was instrumental in helping us get rid of honesty and <laughs> integrity. <laughs> and tell the story in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then, of course, you said you also used a lot of Intel's compensation uh, approaches. Well, I to wanted stock every employee to have uh, yeah. some share of the company. I, I found out only recently that there were a couple people that Steve Jobs denied. Uh, and I didn't know that. If I had known that, I'd have been all over it. But so, for the most part, every Apple employee had some number of shares of stock that they got from a purchase program or from an option. The roles, the, just thinking about the three of you, you, Jobs, and Wozniak, how did your roles change and evolve in this kind of, this, this uh, tornado from 1977 to 81? Uh, well, Woz, really just wanted to be an engineer. He didn't want to be Steve Wozniak managing this, that, or the other thing, uh, part of Apple. He just wanted to work in the labs and design stuff. And so he continued to do that. Um, and as far as I know, he's never, to this day, left Apple as an employee. Um, he was out of it for a while after his plane crash because he had amnesia for darn near a year. Um, but I think he's been an employee from day one till today, I think. And he's happiest just being able to work on what he wants to work on. And, and nobody's going to tell him yay yeah, or nay. <laughs> That's good for him. Yeah. Um, Steve Jobs uh, has always stayed interested and uh, was you know, always interested in, in uh, making new products and, and had, he had a touch for coming up with uh, products that, that people would want. And uh, so his, his role continued to be more on the user experience side of it. You know, he's not a uh, circuit guy. He's not a, a technical person. Uh, but he's a very smart person, and uh, um, I think the Macintosh t shows you that. Sure. But he's al he was also s smart in, uh, you know, uh, people have criticized the idea of having the pirates. Remember the pirates and the big banner on the building and stuff? I, th I thought that was fine because I wanted him to use as much of the least of the technology as made sense. And for them to think they were pirating it away, that was just fine with me. <laughs> 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 and, so, and, and I think the guys in the Lisa department, they, they, they didn't find that uh, onerous or anything. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, and then you, your role, you, you obviously have, you had an operational role and also served as chairman. How did that change during this period? Um, well. It was unfortunate, um, and you know, Scotty's still a, a, a dear friend, but he had some really serious personal problems 
about 1981, just before that, really, 1980. And it started affecting him at work. Uh, his demeanor was not good. I mean, he had some really difficult problems to deal with. And uh, I don't blame him for, you know, his behavior and that, uh, other kinds of things. But uh, it just became obvious that he, co he couldn't run the company for a while at least. And so uh, I got together with the board and we, we let him go. And there just wasn't anybody else to run the company at that time. So I said, okay, I'll do it. But w the, the first thing I'm going to do is get a headhunter and start looking for, <laughs> for a, uh, a, re a replacement. And so I ran it for two years, and uh, you know, we interviewed quite a few people. Um, and uh, we made an offer to one person who didn't accept. And then the next one that we made an offer to did, and that was Scully. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think the, the, the roles changed a whole lot. Uh, I was a different kind of a CEO from Scotty, <laughs> uh, but things were running pretty well uh, in those days. We mm -hmm. Well, you were growing like crazy. We were mm -hmm. growing. We had really good, competent people all over the place in the company. We had great manufacturing folks. We had uh, the peripherals division was, was wonderful, the, the uh, guys that made the floppy disks and all that stuff. Um, and could you still see IBM on the horizon? You guy could still see IBM on the horizon. Matter of fact, the person that we made an offer to that didn't join us was an IBMer. Mm. He was the guy that wrote the business plan for the PC. That's how come I know the business plan for the PC was written on an Apple II. <laughs> With the change in the management structure in, in 1981, um, when Steve became chairman, uh, was that was that a requirement? And did was that a, a sort of necessary phase of the company for that part to happen as well as Mike Scott leaving? Um, no, but the board thought w we should give Steve a, a chance to be chairman and see how he did. You know, he, he was doing a good job at that time. Uh, he was interested in growing and, and learning more, and uh, I was fine with that. It didn't bother me any. It was, I, don't, I didn't think being chairman was particularly important. The only thing was that you had to know how to run a meeting so that people could get <laughs> everything done and said and get out of there. Right. And we had such a fantastic board. Uh, you know, with Henry Singleton, Arthur Rock, um, either Hank Smith or Peter Crisp, who came later for Ben Rock, um, Don Valentine. We had a knock your socks off board. So uh, I wasn't worried about it. And you had, with Scott's departure, big operational things you had to think about personally, I would, I would guess. Yeah, I mean, uh, we were a pretty big company by then. Yeah. I, I, I think we had like more than 10,000 employees. So it wasn't like it was a, a, a little undertaking. <laughs> right. What was your impression of John Scully at the time when he joined in 1983? I thought he, he was uh, a really good choice. I, you know, I thought he was bright and I thought he was motivated and. Uh, uh, I thought he grasped the uh, important part uh, parts of the technology um, fairly quickly. Yeah, I was looking forward to having him uh, take off and run with it. And since Apple had become such a big consumer company at that point, was it was it Scully's consumer background that was important as one of the features that he brought? Well, well, he understood marketing, and that was really important. And, uh, you know, uh, 
when we started the thing, I told the two Steves that I would st I would stay there for four years, and uh, that was seventy seven. So eighty one was time for me to leave, not take over the company and run it. <laughs> and so uh, when we found uh, Scully, I thought, good, this this guy understands marketing. That gives me an opportunity to retire again and not have to worry about this thing. So uh, I, I was just hoping he would be hilariously successful. Did he rely on you when he first came in for advice and, and guidance? I mean, you'd been running the company at that point. Um, he did for a while, but not long. He didn't, need, he didn't need to be coached much. He was running Pepsi. He, he knew what, he was a big boy. So, he, and the company was in pretty good shape. You know, if there, were, if there were huge problems, that would have been a different situation. But, but uh, yeah, he, he took over a, a nice, well-run company and figured out what he needed to know and learned it, and he was off and running. It was also right about this time that you, the Macintosh Lisa um, development was happening, and you referenced that earlier. Um, as this was going on, first Lisa and then Macintosh, what were your views about it at the time? About well, there are two. Th I guess I'm asking sort of two lines of questions. One is, uh, what did you think of the Macintosh first of all as a project, which was such a radical departure in personal computers to begin with, and then second. What did you think about the Macintosh in light of the Lisa, which had tried to do some of the same things but really hadn't been very successful? Um, well, I was always a believer that we could ride a bike and chew gum. And uh, to have two approaches going uh, to me was, okay, we'll find out which one works uh, and we can afford to do that. We don't have to bet the company on one or the other and then and be locked in and fail. We can try two things and one if one succeeds and the other doesn't, so be it. We're, we're in good shape. So uh, I was happy to have uh, the Macintosh uh, program going because it was truly a departure to put everything in the same case. The, uh, it was the first time that that had been done and there were some technical issues that had to be overcome. And I understood the engineering of that, um, and uh, the guys did a good job, you know, putting the display in the same box with the computer. Not, it's, it's not as straightforward as you might think. Um, so I, I was happy to have both of those things going on. W w what I really wanted uh, not to have happen is for them to bifurcate and not talk to one another. What I wanted them to do was collaborate and stand on each other's shoulders and, and, uh, and not reinvent things, but use whatever made sense for each project. And that's kind of the way it worked out. The problem with Lisa was it was just too darn expensive. Uh, and I still get comments from people who had Lisa or still have them. They love the darn thing. <laughs> it was a great computer, but just too expensive and we couldn't get the traction in the business market that we needed. Was that an active discussion at the board level at that point, was whether Apple needed to try to become a business-oriented computer company as well as this great consumer company? Yeah, we kept trying and kept trying and kept trying, and uh, we just never succeeded. Um, I've not told this story publicly, but um, part of the reason was that uh, IBM um, literally threatened some of their customers that uh, if they bought Apple uh, computers, they weren't going to service their mainframe. And that was a big blow. I mean, that, you, you don't overcome that. Uh, the IT guy says, no, we're not, we, we can't touch your computer with a 10-foot pole. What were your thoughts when IBM finally did enter the PC market? 
Because you'd, you'd seen it coming for a long time. Yeah, I thought it was a blessing in disguise um, and a double-edged sword. It legitimized the, the PC as a r real product. Uh, and uh, I knew our sales would go up and IBM's would too. Um, I think that uh, Microsoft and their operating system uh, was, was, had they not copied our user interface, I think they would have, would have had one heck of a hard time competing with us. But they did, and we sued them, and we lost. So uh, it was good in that it legitimized the market for personal computers, but it was not so good in that uh, we didn't have just one competitor, we had 20. Was the Macintosh the computer that was going to make that final, that was going to break into other markets besides the home market, did you think? No, I really didn't expect the Macintosh to be a business computer. Uh, I expected it to be used for certain bits and pieces, uh, but it didn't have color. Uh, it, it was just lacking a whole bunch of things that, that n it needed to really work in the business market. And it was designed to be lower cost and you know, so some of those features were taken out on purpose to, to get into the price range of $2,000. Otherwise, it would have been a $5,000 thing, and we wouldn't have sold any of those either. Like the Lisa. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't, unlike the Apple II, it wasn't an overnight success, was it, when it was introduced? Well, it, it was, and then it tapered off, and then it started to grow again. And I think that was... was uh, I'm just, uh, my impression looking back it, it was, is that we got more developers to put out some really good applications. And that, that set it back on the growth path. We had some evangelist guys that were running around the country. <laughs> they did a good job. So, is uh, 1984 becomes 1985, uh, that's leading up to the period when Steve Jobs leaves Apple. How much did that, can you, can you sort of just walk through that period and give me your own thoughts about what was happening, what the dynamic was, and how that all came about? Well, I wasn't there managing. Um, and, um, I think Steve and John were, were on a diverging path philosophically. And Steve wanted to do s certain things and John wanted to do other things. And uh, John came to the con conclusion that Steve wasn't working for him. <laughs> Steve was doing what Steve wanted to do and that uh, it was disruptive. And I think he made the only decision he could make, which was uh, he can't manage the company if Steve's going to run around and undo things and change it and, and uh, uh, cause him all this grief. So he uh, reorganized and gave Steve a job that didn't have anybody reporting to him and had an office away from the main campus. And, you know, he didn't fire Steve, but he made it so that Steve had nothing to do. Uh, so Steve decided to go off on his own. And uh, the only, I, I don't criticize Steve for wanting to do that or doing it even. But I just wish he had done that by himself, got something started, and then uh, thought about hiring uh, people, whether they were from Apple or anywhere else and d done it on the up and up. And what he did was he got a half a dozen people to agree to go with him. And I felt, uh, I felt that was unethical and 
not the right way to do it. He could have ended up with the same situation and done it like a gentleman. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about <clears throat> the, just from a board member's perspective, Mike, and, and then I'm just going to ask you about your own personal reflections on it, but uh, from, a, from the perspective of a board member, um, this, this would seem to be the kind of thing that builds over time. I mean, it, it, the, just the kind of, I think of the analogy of a storm cloud on the horizon. You see this kind of dynamic working with Scully and Jobs. And is there anything that anybody on the board, you or anyone else ever felt needed to be done or could be done or should be done to try to stave it off or send it in a different direction? Uh, no, no, John had uh, uh, it's not complained. John had advised the board that these uh, this issue was coming up, and uh, um, I don't think John expected or wanted the board to do anything. He just wanted to make sure that uh, the board knew what was going on, and the board could make whatever decision they needed to make should the time come. And uh, he finally decided that uh, he didn't want Steve in the company, or if he was in the company, he didn't want him messing around with, with his decisions. Um, and uh, either he would have to let him go, or he would quit, or the board would fire John. So the board knew what was going on, but it wasn't our place to get involved. Uh, boards don't do that. Boards are supportive and helpful when they can be. And, and I think the board did a good job there. And then just as far as your own, <coughs> your own personal reflections, you know, w we see it all the time in Silicon Valley, don't we? The founder syndrome, uh, the guy who starts the company or maybe has the first idea stays with it and stays with it for a good long time like this. Evan for eight years, but then finally can't stay on for, for whatever reason. Did you expect that that eventually might happen as you got started with jobs and, and then the whole thing progressed? Did you feel that at some point there would be a day when it all might blow up like that? Uh, actually, I didn't. I, I was surprised that uh, Steve and John couldn't get along because they were bosom buddies for a long time. And uh, it was just surprised me that all of a sudden they disagreed. Yeah, but that, I mean, <laughs> things like that happen. Yeah. Not much you can do about it. You had seen Noisley Fairchild under similar kinds of circumstances. Did you ever think about that when you watched this unfolding at Apple? Oh, no. Uh, when Bob left Fairchild, it was completely different. Um, the um, uh, Fairchild was a division, the semiconductor division of Fairchild Cameron Instrument. And they had put uh, Bob on the board of Fairchild Cameron Instrument. Uh, and uh, what was going on is the other divisions of Cameron Instrument were taking all the profits that Semiconductor was making uh, and subsidizing the other divisions who, that weren't doing well, which meant that Fairchild Semiconductor couldn't spend the amount of money they wanted to in R&D. And Bob and Gordon were savvy enough to know that that's the only way to stay ahead in the semiconductor business is you have to be inventing all the time. So Bob very much disagreed with that strategy that Cameron Instrument was was implementing. And uh, I've been told, I don't know this firsthand, but I've been told that they offered to make him president of the whole thing. Uh, there was, I think there was a guy by the name of John Carter that was president. Um, anyway, I, I don't know all this firsthand, so don't take it to the bank. But uh, Bob came to the conclusion that there was no way that Cameron Instrument was going to stop taking all those profits from the semiconductor. And uh, I think they had a man-to-man -man discussion. 
And he said, fine, if that's what you want to do, then I, I, I'm going to leave. And uh, he did. So I don't think it was uh, a knockdown drag out. I think it was a, we, we're going to agree to disagree, and if that's what you, you want to do, then I, I'm going to leave. And I don't think he had funding for Intel at the time that that happened. Uh, you know, I don't think he and Gordon uh, had planned a company. I think they just decided we're going to we're going to walk out the door, and then we'll go figure out what we're going to do next. And they had enough confidence in Arthur uh, that I, I think they knew that they could get funding <laughs> no matter what they wanted to do. So. Uh, I see it as a, a lot different situation, and I think that I think it was only the three of them. I don't know that they took anybody else uh, when they left. I know they hired other people later, but they didn't. Ha I mean, they didn't have any a company to hire them. <laughs> that was to bring them into at that yeah, point. Yeah, they had to go build a company first. Yeah, yeah. So, maybe Roger Borovoy went with them. I don't know. Were you, uh, did your own working role on the board change that much after Steve left? Was that a, a period where people were looking to you? You were the, probably the senior director on the board at that point. Uh, no, I, I don't think there was. Uh, there wasn't a need for institutional memory, or uh, I, I think my role stayed the, about the same. Uh, I didn't want to be the chairman, you know, and uh, being a vice being vice chairman was fine with me. Uh, in case Scully got hit by a bus, you know, it just wasn't much different. So. It was fine. And then your subsequent relationship with Jobs, I just wanted to ask that question here because there's a, more to talk about. But from everything I've read and everything you've said, it, it seems to have remained pretty free from any kind of lingering upset during that whole period. Is that, well, is, he, is that true? He knew what I thought. Uh, I, I never, I'm not a hold back person. <laughs> and. Uh, W was he talking to you during that period? Was he seeking oh, your yeah, advice? Yeah, he would call me up uh, every th two or three months, maybe, uh, and uh, either ask me to come over and take a look at the new products and and uh, comment on them, um, or he'd call me up just, uh, just to say, oh, wow, we've just passed Sony and market cap, you know. Um, and uh, he'd invite me to come to the uh, uh, developers conference and the, and the Macworld things. Um, so we had a relationship, but uh, what is, is, you know. Uh, he, he, he did what he did, and that's what he thought he had to do. Uh, I don't think it's right, still don't, but uh, we agreed to disagree on that one, I guess. On his on his departure, on the way he departed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so then, the period from eighty five to ninety three is is from a business standpoint, it's pretty turbulent. Uh, yeah, Apple's getting competition from all sides. People are the market's changing. Uh, personal computing is exploding. What was that like? Well, as you said, it was it was turbulent, and there were, uh, you know, for for a long period in there, I thought Scully was doing a really good job. The marketing was good. Uh, uh, I just uh, I didn't have any real real complaints, um, but some at some point in in that time frame. I think John um, got bored with it or got tired of running Apple or I, I didn't know what happened. Mm -hmm. But he's, it just, to me, it seemed like he just took his eye off the ball. When we'd go to a board meeting and I'd ask questions about profits and stuff, he didn't know the numbers. 
uh, it was just like he wasn't interested anymore. Mm. And uh, I think it was I think it was true, and it took the board a couple of years to realize it uh, that that was really going on, because it, it wasn't it wasn't easy to to see it because it was a little bit at a time, <laughs> and uh, we just didn't we just couldn't believe that he was not running the company, which is what was happening. Mm. Did you ever get the feeling maybe it was just just too much? I mean, it was just, he came in from just a completely different background and maybe it was just beyond him? No, I think he got interested in politics and other things. Mm. Uh, he was running back and forth to New York and Washington, D.C. Uh, he just wasn't paying attention to the company. I, I, I think he over, he was overconfident that the people r r running Apple and making the decisions would get it right without him, and they didn't. Do you remember when the board decided it finally had to come to grips with that, and yeah. how did you feel about it? Uh, sad. <laughs> yeah. Sad. What was the what was the sort of catalytic? moment or was was there one um, I don't think there was any one thing you know I, I just remember one of the board members saying you know I think it's time yeah. and we all agreed you know, <laughs> you know. Um, then, you know, as I was doing research on this, Mike, I'd completely forgotten about the, uh, very soon after Scully leaves, the negotiations with IBM. Suddenly IBM pops up and a possible acquisition of Apple starts being talked about. H how did that happen? Um, you know, I don't know how it got initiated. Uh, and uh, Spindler was running the company then. And um, there were a lot of, of meetings. And uh, I'm trying to think of the then president of IBM, Gerstner, Lou Gers Gerstner. Um, it was his idea to buy Apple for a song. He just, I mean, his perception of what Apple was worth was down here, and our perception of what Apple was worth was up here. And we just, we couldn't get anywhere close to a, an agreement. If you'd been able to close that gap, did you feel it was a good move strategically yeah. for Apple? Yeah, I thought it, I thought it could make a lot of, I thought it could be as helpful to IBM uh, as it could be to Apple. I thought it was a, a real win-win because our culture was hugely useful for IBM to grab some of it. <laughs> you know, it would have been great for IBM. Uh, and we really had good technology and good product. And uh, with the, the strength of IBM, I figured uh, we'd no longer have that roadblock in the business market. Uh, so I thought it would be an absolute win-win but we were just night and day yeah. apart. <coughs> um, and then, I mean, it's, it's still un, a little unbelievable how in the rapid succession that these things happened, it seems like Apple has always lived in a, a different time zone from every <laughs> other company because all of these things are happening in the period of about 18 months or two years. So it's the very next year uh, uh, after the IBM negotiations collapsed that Steve Jobs comes back. Uh, well, you have to remember that uh, Spindler leaves. Yes. And uh, he too had some personal problems, which was pr pretty interesting. And uh, Gil Emilio right. takes over. And uh, Gil, uh, Gil is the guy that came to the conclusion that we needed to buy an OS. 
and uh, we looked at all the ones available, and he and his team came to, con to the conclusion that we should buy the next OS. Do you remember what it was about the operating system that was so attractive? It, it, it was well written and it was strong. Um, it was uh, Unix based. Um, and, you know, the uh, other one we looked at was B, and uh, Jean Louis uh, had done a really good job with that, but it wasn't finished. And uh, um, Steve had some pretty good people that would come along with it. Um, and, you know, there were, there were pros and cons f for each. But uh, I think they made the right decision, uh, you know. Was your impression that Steve was really selling hard at that point, that he really wanted this to happen? You know, um, I wasn't involved in, in the details of that. And, you know, that was Gil's baby. So I, I don't know how hard Steve was selling or not. Right. And and I then I would I just wonder if it was uh, if it was always assumed that if you bought next that Jobs would come back that his return was part of the package was that was it clear at that time or was no, it no I don't think it was a uh, an issue if he wanted to come back fine if he didn't fine. I don't think that we, you know, what, what we wanted was the OS right. and Avi Tavanian. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, Avi did come in and yeah, he's write also some incredible software. He's a wonderful guy, too. Yeah, yeah. He's been here. We did a great interview with Avi and Gordon Bell together. Oh, that'd be fun. Yeah, that was very fun. Um, and then, uh, did you have any personal feeling about Jobs coming back, rejoining the board, coming back into the company? Uh, not really. I, I was just trying to find a time where uh, I could uh, get off of the board. I'm not, you know, I was getting older. <laughs> and uh, with all the turmoil for the previous four or five years, uh, you know, I was saying, they're just not a good time, you know. It, it always seems like there's something awful that needs to be attended to, and uh, how can I leave when that's going on? Yeah. And so I was thinking, great, we're, we're going to get this resolved, then I can leave. <laughs> and so on the 20th anniversary of your, your the, the start of Apple, you do leave. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't quite the 20th. I never quite made it to 20. Was it? Uh, I think I left in '96. I don't know what the official date is. Maybe it's '97. I don't know. I I picked that up from a couple of places that it was January '97. Although maybe you didn't get all the way to the day. It's p possible. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. So as you look back on on your experience in that amazing 20 years, what individuals stand out for you that? We maybe we haven't talked about yet. Anyone else that you would mention that was really key? Well, Henry Singleton and Arthur are the Mount Everests of, <laughs> of intellect and experience and knowledge about uh, how you make a great company. And um, there were, uh, before Henry died, very, very close friends and had very, very differing opinions about a lot of things. <laughs> and to hear them discuss these things in a board meeting, uh, just so valuable, uh, just um, not measurable how, how much they contributed to Apple's growth. And uh, so I would say that, you know, outstanding, yeah, those two guys are outstanding. And then as an engineer, uh, as you look back on the technology, how would you rate the technology over that 20-year period that Apple produced? I even liked the Newton. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, a lot of the ideas that are in the uh, iPad today really started with Newton. Yeah. And uh, it was big and clunky and all that stuff. But it was uh, pretty well done for its day. Well, and wildly imaginative, too. Yeah, and, and it had some really nice little applications that ran on it. And uh, people that had them just loved them. And uh, so I don't, e I, even the failures, <laughs> if you want to call Newton a failure, I, th I thought were pretty good technology. I, I think Apple has been very, very fortunate in being able to attract some of the top technical people on the, on the planet. I, I really do. And then the final thing I want to ask you about the Apple period, Mike, is, um, and I actually got this question from Donna uh, Dubinsky when I talked <laughs> to her last week. Okay, she I can said, get even then. She said, uh, uh, have you read the Isaacson book? Yeah. From your perspective, what do you think he got right and what do you think he got wrong? Well, um, somebody asked me that question the other day when I was doing the thing with Arthur. And uh, my answer was, uh, there are a bunch of little things in there that are not correct that uh, Walter should have probably got right. Um, but he hit the spirit and the essence of Steve and Apple right on the head. So all those little things, they don't really matter. It, it just, the things that I know aren't right. Being an engineer, <laughs> is, I'd like to call Walter up and say, fix this, fix that, fix this, fix that, you know. He says, I had a gold Corvette. I've never had a gold Corvette. Where he got that, I don't know. So uh, really, the, the overarching book is, is very, very well done and worth reading and I think uh, just great. But I'm sure that in addition to the little things I know are wrong, there are other little things that are probably wrong too. Uh, and I hope that doesn't detract from people reading the book because I mean, they don't matter. <laughs> They're just little stuff. Uh, so I think it's a, a good book and well worth reading. And uh, I enjoyed it. So it's, you've had an, another amazing, I guess we could call this your third career, couldn't we? this last 15 years from the time you left the Apple board to now. Uh, let's talk a yeah, little phase bit about three. <laughs> what you've been doing. Yeah, phase three. Yeah. The, the, the Markless Center for Applied Ethics at Santa oh. Clara University, how and why create that? Well, it was started in 1986. Uh, so it started 10 years before I left the board. I don't know, or 11, I don't know which. Um, I had felt that we had raised two generations of ethical agnostics. People that were running companies that I knew, people that were in responsible positions in companies that I knew. Uh, it's not that they were unethical, it's just that ethics was not on their radar screen when they were making decisions. It was all based on the, the dollars and cents uh, or their own advancement or this or that, whatever the process. But ethics wasn't something that, that uh, they thought about. And I didn't like th that conclusion. And uh, I was at a seminar at Santa Clara University and uh, the guy that was giving the talk said that uh, they had thought about uh, starting a center for ethics and my little light bulb went on so I went up after after the talk and I said are you really uh, sure about this and he said yeah we actually wrote up some papers and I said well I'd be interested in financing something like that can we get together and and uh, sure enough I got about a five-page letter and <laughs> I sat down with those guys and we, we designed the uh, Center for Applied Ethics. And w what, 
w when you think about the contributions that the center has made and, and what you hope it's going to also do in the future, how would you describe that? Uh, I will say that it is, without question, the most bang for my philanthropic buck uh, that I've ever gotten. Uh, they have done marvelous work, uh, not just in business ethics, but in medical ethics, in educational ethics, in government ethics. Um, it's, it is today the largest ethics center in the world. Um, it has reach that goes all the way to Beijing. It's a very, very fine uh, organization, and, and I'm really proud of what it's done. Um, Nursing ethics, I, I, <laughs> I can go on and on and on. It, uh, they've really done a good job. Do, do you interact much with the students there that are going through it? I have in the past, but I, I'm not that active. Um, as you know, I was uh, a trustee there for 29 years mm -hmm. and was uh, chair of the board for the last six. And I'm just trying to get off of the treadmill of having regular meetings that I need to attend. <laughs> so I, my wife and I can say, well, it's Thursday. Let's go play golf in Carmel. You know? right. Oh, no, I can't. I have a board meeting. Yeah. So, uh, you must be really pleased, though, when you see the students and the work. And uh, what gave, really gave me a great amount of personal satisfaction is where the cafeteria is, it's called Bannon Hall. And there's a huge blackboard uh, that's set up right by the entrance. And every day, uh, somebody from the center goes and puts an ethical dilemma type question at the top of the blackboard. And the kids come in, and they read that, and they put, it, put their thoughts. They put their answers. Uh, and uh, reading, that <laughs> reading that thing is more fun and seeing how seriously those kids can get involved with it. Uh, it's just a little thing, you know, a little blackboard, but I think it's just delightful. Yeah, yeah. And then you did Echelon, too, another, mm -hmm. a, another startup, another, uh, it almost it seems like it grew out of your, your own personal interest in just having a home work better. Well, it's not just, uh, the technology is ubiquitous. It's just like a screwdriver. Mm -hmm. You know, screwdrivers, you can use them anywhere in the world, and you can use them on your car, or you can use them <laughs> wherever there's things put together with screws. And the technology that Echelon developed uh, is distributed intelligence control systems. So, it works in any application where you want to control something, and you don't need a central intelligence to do it. You put the intelligence in each bit and piece that needs to be controlled. And uh, that turns out to be a very interesting architecture for that, uh, because if one bit fails, the whole system can continue to work. Uh, when you have a central control system, <laughs> If that fails, you're done. Yeah. <laughs> it's all over. And so it works for lighting controls, air conditioning controls, um, uh, smart meters for, for the grid. Uh, I, the problem is the same. Sense whether something's on or off or in between, turn something on or off or in between, and communicate with all the other intelligent nodes. That's the same exact problem, whether it's uh, uh, running a car or an airplane or a factory or a home or a building or you know so it's, it's, ubiqui it's ubiquitous it's a great technology where do you think this is headed it's not clear right now uh, the biggest market that has uh, some traction is uh, metering smart meters, yeah. um, but I'd like to see it take off better in many other areas. Building controls, is uh, th that's going fine, that's a solid market. Um, street lighting is taking off w on a worldwide basis. So we got uh, Oslo, we got, uh, many of the cities around the world are using that technology to control the street lighting. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, it pays for itself in like two years. Uh, and it kind of cuts their power bill like 55 percent. So, I mean, so street lighting's going well. Um, you know, the Honeywells of the world build it in and don't tell anybody it's in there. Uh, so when you buy a thermostat from Honeywell, you might be buying Echelon technology. Um, uh, McDonald's has specified that all the equipment that goes in any of their new kitchens has to be lawn works compatible. So you know, there's a lot of things, uh, but nothing has really, really taken off like the meters have. And, uh, I'd like to see that happen. Mm -hmm. And then the the Jet Center too, which is another thing I wanted to ask you about, especially since since that's so local. What's your vision for that? <laughs> well, you, you know, I sold that. Yes. Okay. Um, that's another Bob Noyce story. Uh, I bought my first airplane in 1980, and uh, hired a couple of guys to fly it for me. It was a little tiny Learjet. Uh, model 36, which has enough range to go to Hawaii. And the two guys I hired, uh, one of them still worked for me, as a matter of fact, uh, said, well, you're not going to be flying all the time. We should probably uh, do a charter certificate and, and you know, rent the airplane when you're not using it. And it'll keep us current and, and offset the cost of the airplane. So I said, fine, that sounds good. You know, and and uh, no vision, no nothing, just, oh, okay. <laughs> just practicality. Yeah, it makes sense, let's do it. Yeah. And uh, so we started chartering the airplane, uh, and then uh, we had to have maintenance because of, of uh, getting a charter certificate, you have to have a director of maintenance and so on, and w we wanted that anyway. So we had this little kernel of a business uh, to, uh, for aircraft management, and we had the charter certificate, and then other people would come up and ask me uh, if, if uh, I would manage their airplane and put it on my charter certificate. And, and the business grew. We ended up with 35 corporate jets <laughs> and personally owned jets. Uh, and uh, we, we just ran such a tight ship. And it was so straightforward. We weren't trying to make a huge profit, just make a tiny profit. And all the maintenance stuff was passed through. We didn't tack on extra charges for that. Um, and we got, the, uh, got a f uh, fuel sales permit from the airport so we could uh, sell fuel. And so people would fly in and get tank up and fly out. And so it just built a very nice little business. That was called ACM Aviation. Mm -hmm. And one of our best clients, of course, was Mr. Noyce. <laughs> he had a seaplane, by the way. That's another f fun story, uh, along with his other airplane. And uh, Bob and I, I told you, Bob and I used to fly all over the place. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Bob had bought his airplane from Jim Lafferty, who was interested in building another FBO on the other side of the field. And so Bob, being my friend, and, and said, let's all get together and see what comes out of that. Because I already had the operation on the east side of the field. So we did, and Bob and I became the lead investors in the San Jose Jet Center. And so we had those two operations going for, I don't know, 15 years. And at some point, we decided to, to uh, combine them, mainly because the airport wanted to get all of general aviation on the west side of the field instead of the east side. And our lease was going to run out, so I said, great, we'll just put the two companies together. And so they did not have the aircraft management and the charter certificate, and we did. Uh, we had the fuel sales, they had fuel sales. Um, so we combined them and uh, ran it that way for, I don't know, another 10 years, whatever it was. And uh, one day, 
Macquarie came around and they own Atlantic Aviation, which is a chain of FBOs. And they said, we want to buy this. And they made us an offer that was quite nice. <laughs> 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 so we, uh, we took it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the story of San Jose Jet Center. Okay. What, um, <clears throat> as we sort of come to the end of this, I was going to ask you a few questions about, well, first of all, I'm, I'm dying to know, how are you doing on your list of 52 things that you really wanted to do? Pretty, pretty well. Yeah. I still have a few left, but uh, um, I, I'm doing pretty well at it. One thing that wasn't on there was playing golf, and, and I've added that since. And uh, one thing that was on there was playing more tennis which I've stopped doing since we started playing golf. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you took that up as a hobby recently? What, golf? Yeah. Oh, no. No. Uh, many years ago. Many years ago, okay. Yeah. Uh, and then just as you look back, sort of, you've got a huge career still ahead of you, it seems, but as, as you think about the lessons that you would take away from all of this to this point, what would those be? Um... Well, I'll give you a couple. Uh, one is not my uh, thing. It came from Henry Singleton. And uh, it's just a simple statement. There are no secrets. And most people balk at that and, until you think about it for about an hour. And you will come to the conclusion that it's absolutely 100% correct. And uh, wow, has that? Understanding that has simplified my life <laughs> immensely. And I learned it in a board meeting uh, where we had an, um, an Apple employee that had embezzled. A, a I mean, you'd never think we would, uh, the way we ran that company, that somebody would be stealing money from us. But there was, and we didn't know about it. And it was embarrassing that we hadn't caught it. And. So what w we were discussing was it sure would be nice if we could just not say anything about this for a couple of weeks until we knew how to do this and knew how to do that. And then we had this big, long discussion going in the boardroom, and, and, and Henry was just sitting there, <laughs> you know, waiting until we were all through. And that's all he said. There are no secrets. We put out a press release that afternoon, and that was the right thing to do. But that was the only right answer. But other things have come up in my professional career that have given me that same kind of angst. Gee, I wish I could have some more time to figure out how I'm going to present this or do that. Uh, or uh, you make a decision on an employee that th that employee really needs to go and you want to put it off for a month. Uh -uh. Just, just uh, understand that, that that's what you ought to do. Right. So th that's, a, that's a lesson that I learned, and I'm indebted to Henry for that. Um, and my, my good friend, Dr. Noyce, had a uh, mantra that he would tell uh, young folks. Uh, and, and it went like, uh, you know, if. He'd be, they'd be talking about what they want to do in their life, and he, he would tell them they should create value. Don't just rearrange it. And then he would say, be an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I really think that the idea of creating value as opposed to m moving dollars around um, to me, that is the only place there is true personal satisfaction, is, is not uh, somebody else has money and you take it, or some possessions and you take it. That, that's not satisfying. But if you create value, uh, then you can have pride in that. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I credit Bob for having that that uh, mantra. Uh, he was a great guy. Those are two great observations. 
If you, the last question, and maybe you wrote something down about this, did, if you were giving advice to someone just starting out in an engineering career, what would it be? I think I already told you the answer to that one. Keep your nose to the grindstone, do a great job, and let the chips fall wherever they may. You'll, you'll succeed. Really. Good. Don't worry about all that other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been great, Mike. Thank you. Well, so thank much. you. Yeah.